Welcome back, everybody, to the second session. My name's Claire Jackson. I'm the Education Director at Gallifrey Tri. So we're a main contractor, very active in the education sector, and particularly within the special needs um, subsector. Um, so following on from this morning's kind of introduction where uh, Andre m talked about the, the kind of greater emphasis on the role of mainstream settings within the sort of special provision, um, this session is going to look at uh, special needs within the mainstream. I'm just going to quickly introduce the speakers. Uh, so we've got James Humphreys, <coughs> who is the head teacher for Kentish Town Primary School. And James's school has got two resource bases within it, but the philosophy of the school is very much that those bases are completely kind of in integrated and not a separate part of the school. Uh, and he's going to talk about how the, how the children are fully included within, within the mainstream. Uh, and then Martin Harvey uh, from McAvoy, who is the head of design and technical services. Martin's going to present some case studies featuring uh, special needs provision within mainstream settings and looking at how uh, a modular solution for, for the for the sil for facilities have addressed some of the challenges presented on those projects. And then Andrew Ball, who is project director at Pinnacle, is an ff &E consultant with extensive experience in special needs. And... Um, Andrew's going to sh talk about how furniture can improve the inclusivity and help future-proof for those changing needs that we see within our uh, settings. So I'd like to hand over to, to James first. Well, this is a very different Thursday morning. I'd usually be doing singing assembly on a Thursday morning. I, I have to say, uh, I'm, this is wonderful being here talking about special needs with uh, such, a, such an engaged and enthusiastic audience. So I've been asked to just give a, a quick sort of run through of um, our journey. So I'm the head at uh, Kentish Town Church of England Primary School. It's one form of entry in the London Borough of Camden. Uh, unusually, it's a local authority maintained school. I know lots of schools outside London are in mats, but Camden is very unusual in that it doesn't really have uh, any academies particularly. So our journey towards inclusion, um, I've worked at the school for 20 years, not as the head. Uh, I had other roles before I became the head. I've been the head for over 10 years. And so this is a, it's very much a distillation of work that we've done over a, quite a long period of time. Uh, don't think, please, that we've done this work very quickly and, and very recently. So um, when I started at the school in uh, early 2000s, it, it was and still is a mainstream school, serves a very diverse uh, socio-economic um, and cultural kind of community. 300-plus um, children at that time. It's in the middle of Camden, so we're not in Hampstead at the top, we're not in Somerstown down in the south. We're kind of halfway up. If, if, uh, if you've got a sense of the ge geography. We have had, since the late uh, 90s, resource provision for up to six children with physical disabilities. So those children have typically got cerebral palsy uh, or spina bifida or another physical um, difference that means that we, uh, we uh, include them in our provision. The school, what the school had right from, from that early period was a strong culture of inclusion. And that came from governors who very much wanted the physical base to be in the school. Working with parents and hearing their voice uh, was obviously a really important part of what we do. Training teachers and the local authority were very committed even then to having uh, physically disabled children and there was an accessibility project which ran from 2001 to 3 I think which meant that all of the teaching spaces were on the ground the school was organized so that all of those spaces were on the ground floor we had an inspection in 2002 and it went very well and so inclusion was highlighted the inclusion of those six children and so we decided that we would respond to a consultation from the local authority to host potentially a resource base for children with autism. And there was quite a, uh, an extensive discussion. We worked with Claire Barton and her team from Haverstock, who were the architects, 
And we, there was a discussion about should... I think the local authority vision was to have a, a, a unit. They really wanted two classrooms, one for Key Stage 1 and one for Key Stage 2. And they wanted, I think, originally it was eight children who were autistic, half of them be in one class, half be, would be in the other. And we had a very long discussion with, uh, with governors and with the local authority, and we said, no, we don't want to do that. Our physically disabled children are included in everything that we do. If we can't include them, we don't do it, whatever it is. So actually, in developing the, the autism base, we want the whole school to be the resource base. And I think there was some head scratching, and the previous head who was leading at the time was very canny because what that meant was the whole school was refurbished and made appropriate for children to include children who are autistic. So the budget went from a couple of hundred thousand to I think 2.8 million. So it was a it was a good move. This was pre the coalition, not to be too political, but it was pre coalition. So so the decision was made for the whole school to be the resource base to include these children uh, with a diagnosis of autism. So that's what the school looks like. The front is a Victorian building from 1849, uh, and then we have this wonderful extension. It's a piece of architecture uh, which extended the original, the original space. And to work in that building, as I have done for 20 years, is, is a joy because the way the building's been adapted and extended and made really, it's bespoke for the children who come to our provision. Uh, and we've, we've ex extended it and changed it since we did the work with Haverstock in 2010. So what we've got is all of the teaching spaces are on the ground floor. There is a lift and there are some offices upstairs, but no child, occasionally a child in a wheelchair will say, James, can we go to first name school? Can we go in the lift? Can we go up? And then we go up, and then they look and see it's really boring, and then they come back down again, and then they come out. But we have got two sensory rooms, which is, is an extraordinary level of provision in a mainstream school, and that means we can provide really effectively for children with, um, who are neurodiverse, but also other children who, who might need to access that, that kind of low arousal space or have some sensory input. Good SEM practice, as we all know, is good practice for all children. We've also got a designated therapy room, and that means that children can use a swing to regulate if they need to do that. They can have physiotherapy input in, in that, that room. Occasionally, a child might need to go in there and throw a chair. That's fine. They can do that as well. Um, and, of course, we can use that as a breakout space to, to, to work with small groups of children, giving them additional input. The, the building is a huge asset, and it really helps us to include as effectively as we do. Um, we've also got things like picking up on comments from colleagues this morning. Every teaching space is acoustically baffled, so that manages the, the, the noise uh, sensory overload for children. The light is really well managed in terms of what comes into the building. We've got extra width doors so that children who use electric wheelchairs can get through without rolling over your foot, which they do from time to time. Um, so lots and lots of different things have been considered, and the building is absolutely wonderful. It really does help us to include as effectively as we, as, as we do. So the current prov provision and the reasons why it works so well, um, so we've got all of the children in both resource bases sit within our published admissions numbers, and that's intentional. So they're not extra, they're not other, they're not additional. They are within the 30 in each year group. We're one form entry, as I've said. That means the teachers consider them to be their children in their class. They're fully included. The children love it because they... They don't feel different, and parents absolutely love it because they don't feel the stigma of going to an alternative provision which is based in a hut on the school site. Sometimes colleagues have to work in those conditions, and, and of course, you know, you, you do what you have to do. But in our context, the fact that they're included in, in, within the classroom, within the 30, is hugely beneficial for the children, and parents tell us that they love it. 
So we've got seven children currently. We're oversubscribed in the physical base. We've got 17 children. The official capacity is 15, but we're always pushed over. And then we've got three children in the mainstream who also have an EHCP, and they've all got a diagnosis of autism, the, the, the extra children. So we've got um, 27 children in a, in a one-form entry school with an education healthcare plan. That's a very high level of inclusion. Uh, we, we are also funded, obviously, to, to include those children. Um, it is a challenge. It's also an absolute joy. So, the reasons why we can do it, staff. Staff really make this happen. We've got a very, very big team of TAs. The TA team is more than twice the size of the teaching team. Governors and leaders at every level really believe in inclusion, really believe in, in the provision that we make for these children. Ethos and culture at every level is, is about inclusion. Continual staff training and development. We hold the license for, to train for the Autism Education Trust, so all of our staff are trained annually on the AET materials, and we also train other schools in Camden uh, on those materials as well, because we want schools to be able to, to, to include you know, highly inclusive mainstream schools. Investment in staff expertise. We've sponsored people to take a master's in autism. We've got three people who've done that. Uh, teaching assistants have done distance learning with um, Birmingham University, who've got an excellent uh, online offer around neuro neurodiversity. Um, and we've sponsored all sorts of other staff to take other, other training, which is specific to autism because we really feel that we need experts in, the field, in this particular field in order to make excellent provision for our children. And we also do a lot of partnership work. Um, you know, UNICEF, we're a rights-respecting school, so we teach our children about their rights, uh, which are laid out in the United Nations Convention, one of which is about the government's obligation to give children with a disability more. So we teach them that they're entitled to, to the provision that we make for them. Uh, we work really well with Camden Learning. We're part of Challenge Partners, which is a national school-to-school -school improvement uh, group. And we also have a partnership with Community Playthings who are working. They're doing a lot of work around workstations, developing workstations for children who might need a lower sensory arousal space. Uh, and we're, we're a case study school for them, which basically means they take lots of glamorous photos and we get lots of free equipment, which is brilliant. Works really well for us and for them. Um, and then finally, I haven't mentioned Ofsted, and that's intentional, but I have mentioned, I have got here some feedback from parents and this is the most important thing, I think, to us as a school is that these are some of the comments that, um, that the parents feedback to us. When we were last inspected, a parent said to me on the gate, well, it won't go that well, will it? Because we've got so many SEN children and that affects our data. And the outcome was incredibly positive for exactly that reason. Because the school's so inclusive and we're making provision for children with complex needs, that was seen as exceptional and uh, the inspection went very well. Uh, and it was, it was wonderful that that was the outcome, given that the parents' anticipation was that it was all about data. So that's the feedback. And that's it. I've kept it very short. You're very lucky, because if you give, <laughs> if you give a head teacher a PowerPoint and an audience, <laughs> it could go on for a lot longer, I can assure you. Claire. Questions for you. We'll do those at the end. So, okay. James, Thanks thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, it's actually almost a year ago since I presented at a similar conference, and uh, a lady came up to me afterwards. I thought she was, I was going to get a compliment. She said, I didn't understand a word you said. <laughs> <laughs> You speak far too fast, so <clears throat> I've spent a year trying to slow down, but here, good luck to you. Um, okay, so I'm here uh, today, uh, my, my name is Martin Harvey, I'm uh, Head of Design and Technical Services uh, for the McAvoy Group. Uh, 
long tail really responsible just for all aspects of design. So, who are McAvoy? Well, we are off-site manufacturers with 50 plus years experience in this uh, sort of, this car, the most current wave of off-site construction, off-site manufacturing, to have 50 years experience is, is, um, is, is a lot, so that that's, helps us set us aside. We have two main wings to our, um, to our business. One is permanent off-site and one is rental and sales. I'm gonna to touch on both of them today. You'll probably see more of the permanent off-site towards the end. And really what that means is the permanent off-site is we do, everything we build or provide is manufactured off-site um, in our factory in Lisburn, just outside Belfast. However, the permanent off-site is probably more um, competitive with traditional construction, whereas the rental and sales is for rapid delivery of projects, um, can be, as in the title, rented or sold, and uh, for quick delivery and probably at the lower economical um, range of, of buildings. So some of the benefits of using modular and SEND facilities, I am not here to say that I am an, uh, an SEN specialist. There are a lot more specialists in the room than me. What we as a, a main contractor, a principal contractor do is we can provide bespoke spaces and uh, using our standardized systems to facilitate the needs of the client. And we work with specialist design teams all the time, clients, uh, TAs, um, to actually deliver those projects um, in line with what the, the employer wants. So these are some of the benefits, and I'm gonna highlight just a few that, that stand out when it comes to delivering SEN facilities. The ability to respond to change in demands. Um, our buildings can be adapted, reused, recycled. We can be moved from one location to another. One of our standard uh, products at the minute, uh, SmartSpace 27, it is, it's got a designed with at least a 15 year life. That sounds, that's not that very much, but this building has been designed that it can be moved around and relocated from site to site to, and to meet the needs of the clients. We all know that changing cohorts come in with changing needs, so this is an opportunity for us to um, give buildings to our clients where they can move it from one site to another to maybe meet the needs of a different cohort. Uh, education for all, same provision locally. Really, we've got a couple of case studies here where there's significant need in an area. They need it quickly, um, and we can provide that accommodation quickly within a mainstream school in very, very tight sites, which I'll, I'll explain in some of the uh, case studies. Installation, one of our case studies is, is a, a job, there's only seven modules. It was two main classrooms, a number of therapy rooms and meeting rooms. It just uh, equated to seven modules. We landed those seven modules in one day. So when you're talking about delivering projects to mainstream schools, we can do that very, very quickly with minimal disruption, which I think we're gonna mention here anyway. Uh, adaptable and flexible. We have, we, we, we're not in the business of providing all our clients the same building. What we have is a standardized approach, a standardized, we're gonna call it our own system, but a standardized system where we can put multiple buildings together, multiple sizes, various sizes to accommodate the needs of the client. So what we don't do is we try not to, and we can't do it, but we try not to say to the client, that's what you must have. We'll actually work with the client and the client design team to say, <coughs> right, we, you, that's your original design. This is how we could make that work from an offsite construction point of view. Minimize disruption, disruption I touched on. Uh, fully versatile, uh, our buildings can be standalone. We can offer, we have products where it's just one, one unit. Those buildings can be landed in, in a half an hour. Um, we, can, we have other systems where we can put multiple uh, modules together to create bespoke buildings, bespoke spaces. Um, and then we've got the permanent offsite side of the business, which again is significantly quicker than traditional construction, but it is, uh, you know, obviously we act as principal contractor at that stage and we take it right through a design and build. So there's probably a, a, as long a pre-con period as there is actually us delivering the project. So funding options, I'm touching on this simply because the, the rental and sales side of the business offers a solution where you know, clients, there's a need, there's a cohort coming in, there's in James's scenario where he's over-prescribed, he needs more space quickly. We can provide that where you don't need a significant capital or any, in some instances, any capital expenditure required upfront. We can put that into a rental period, work with you through that, that the rent only starts at the day that the building is handed over. 
Um, we can deliver those packages bespoke. There's no set one package that uh, meets everybody's needs, um, same as the building. There's no set one building that meets everybody's needs, so we can be flexible around those um, packages and the agreements. And we can do as much or as little as, as the client needs. We can do everything from complete D&B to groundworks, delivering the building, fit out. Um, sometimes we even use Andrew and, and his uh, company to do the fit out. Um, or we can just do building only or shell only or whatever. Uh, so design and flexibility. So I keep talking about standardized solution to create bespoke spaces. This is just some examples of, of what we've provided. Um, we provide a, quite an awful lot of sensory rooms, therapy rooms, um, fun spaces, play spaces, both internally and externally. Uh, just because we are an off-site provider, off-site manufacturer, does not mean that we can't provide these spaces. And, and the other thing is, I'm not saying that traditional contractors can't provide these spaces. Absolutely they can, but we can do it too, but just much quicker. So some of the case studies. This, was, this is a project called Kild uh, Kildare ETNS, which is Educate Together National School. I suppose it's in the title. It is a mainstream school. However, there was 430 square meters in the, just highlighted here in the, uh, in the pink, in the left-hand side, where it's, that was SEN provision in, within that school. Um, it was purpose designed right from the outset. Um, so the, there's doors in there. The access control and security arrangements was extremely high. We worked, this is a, a, a scenario where we were done D&B, brought it through plan and worked with the client hand in hand to deliver that project. So we come up with a design together. Um, I say access control and security was, was key in that particular project into their school and then into the play area. So this created a courtyard in the middle of the school where the only permanent access, there is some other fire escape access, but the only permanent access was from the SEN provision into that secure courtyard area. We actually worked really well on this one um, as well. One of the, the obviously the um, fire alarms and, and breaking of fire alarm, break glasses, et cetera, is something that we come up against with time and time again. And you're juggling between <coughs> securing them so that the kids don't break them as, a, as a, for fun, but then meeting building regulations or other employers' requirements. This one we actually negotiated very well with the building control officer. They were actually able to lift them to a certain height out of reach of most of the kids. Um, we then were encasing them in locked cases, but we also designed in a double knock system into this that the fire alarm wouldn't go off, which was more important in this scheme because it's attached to the rest of the school. If a fire alarm goes off, it would be the whole school is out, and you can imagine the fun that all the rest of the kids would be having with that. So we worked on a double knock system that it took the fire alarm to go off in two different locations in order for it to register the rest of the school. It did pick it up in the SEN um, manager's office, which is in the top left but it didn't put off the rest of the school. So again, that was a, a scenario where McAvoy, our design team, the client, and the regulatory body building control worked together to ease provisions and requirements to facilitate the needs of that school. This one's a very, very different solution. This is a Bell Farm Primary School for Surrey County Council delivered back in, I think, 2019. Um, this is a small seven, this is the building I was saying of seven modules delivered in one day. Again, this is at the sort of economy range of the, the uh, scale in terms of cost. However, this building was needed very quickly. I think it was Surrey, was, this was one of their first SEN centres that they had uh, discussed. It was double classroom, three meeting rooms with therapy rooms um, and, and, uh, and ancillary and staff provision. And I highlight this because where the building's highlighted on the site, the access to this was through the main entrance here, up to the right-hand side, right around the far side of the building, across the playground, and into, the, um, into this area. We were able to deliver those modules significantly well built and finished inside, and deliver them within one day. Now, we finished that there in 12 weeks on site. So it's not, it's not a, we're not there that very long. Plus, we're not, I think of this particular one, we we're approximately five meters away from the building. And this was a live school that we were working on. So what we're saying is we have, an, we have the, the, the products and the ability to deliver projects on live sites with limited disruption. The last one is, uh, that I'm showing here is we're actually currently delivering this hunting over any time at the minute. It's uh, Newman Manor or Newman Catholic College in Manor School. 
Uh, it's approximately 550 square meters of SEN facilities for, I think this one's 11 to 16 year olds. The previous slide was four to 11 year olds. Uh, there is six classrooms in here, staff accommodation, again, therapy rooms, sensory rooms. Um, and the, the, I highlight this one because there was a significant need in the area for the SEN provision. Monarch School offered up this site, which again, it was almost landlocked in terms of the, where the school was. Just to the left, you can about see the residential properties that come right down the side and a road at the, frontage, at the front end. We, we had the restricted site, we had the need, so we just had to make it work. And we worked with planners, uh, we worked with the school, we worked with um, the client, to, to the end users, to get to a building that would fit in there. And that's for approximately five years. Uh, it's, it is a seal, but that building then can be moved over um, afterwards. And again, this is a, the sort of thing that we can, that we have, like anybody delivering projects, planning restrictions, poor groundworks, roots, tree roots, tree removal. We had to work, make all that happen, but there was a glimmer of hope with this site. So we did, we worked through all that and we were able to provide that building in, a, in an otherwise unusable space um, that accommodated that school and hopefully will accommodate them for the next five years. So that's, our, that's the case studies. This is just another example of sort of uh, inclusive environments that we, are, we have a product called Changing Spaces um, C space it is in our company, and these provides like uh, hygiene facilities, changing facilities, toilet facilities, to schools that need it. Um, there are many schools out there that don't have that facility, and we can land these in one module, completely finished inside, and probably hand them over within a few days by the time we finish whatever ground works is around and, and connect them up to the services. So this is a very quick uh, provision that can, as I say, can be uh, delivered very quickly. I'm not gonna go into too much of these, but we're not all just about SEN and mainstream. Uh, West Hill was in an extension um, on site till an existing school. We actually linked two parts of the existing school with a, a new SEN provision. That one was really, really um, highly, it had high acoustic requirements. The external wall on that was a completely bespoke design to reduce the, uh, the, um, the noise coming in because I think this was in, uh, in the flight path. Cardiff City Council, again, look, just different cladding, different sites, uh, six modules features. That was do delivered in 15 weeks. I think the cladding was probably three of those. Um, and then Surrey County Council, again, an 80-place uh, special autism school. It was just over 10 million project. That building, um, it just had, a, it was sitting in a conservation area. It had to blend in and, and be sympathetic with the neighboring buildings. And it's, it's a, I call it the sister, uh, a project of the, uh, the Rise School. The two of them were based very much on the similar footprint, similar design, albeit Cavendish was slightly, uh, slightly larger. And that was on a, on a racetrack design that was again designed with that uh, council and, and, those, and those end users. So that's me. Hopefully somebody understood some of that. Um, <laughs> and uh, to questions at the end. Morning everybody, um, I'm Andrew, Project Director from Pinnacle. Uh, we're an FFE consultant and manufacturer um, covering across the uh, UK. Um, doing a little bit in Lagos in Nigeria at the moment as well, so I'm um, sure we'll be able to help our, our Irish colleagues that are here. Um, first of all, I'm just going to uh, reiterate some of the information we had earlier in terms of setting the scene and then the role of um, research that our partner VS have done on loose furniture um, and, their, and the role within um, education. And then I've just got three areas of discussion um, around fitted furniture, how we maximize our estates, and then investing for the future with loose furniture. So we've already had a lot of detail from the DFE on the, on the needs and the increasing needs and the more. Um, but really, I guess the, the overarching message on this slide is the, the fact that there's more and more pupils with an SEN um, diagnosis that are in mainstream education. Um, so we're now in 2023, that went up to 17.3%. Um, quick poll, 10 years ago, what do we think that number was? Was it, so the first one's gonna be less than 5%. Second one is between five and 10. 
and the third is between 10 and 17. So those who think it's less than five, show your hands. Anyone who thinks it's between five and 10% 10 years ago? And between 10 and 17%. So the answer in Jan 2013, it was 2.8% of students with an SEN vision were in mainstream schools. So we can see the exponential growth over the last 10 years. Um, so the challenge is there's a real driving need for accessible and adaptive learning environments um, to bridge the gap and ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity. And one of the solutions um, is using FFE strategically to break down those barriers and cater to diverse need. Um, so this, uh, this piece of work that's been undertaken by, by BS Furniture, who are based in um, Germany, manufacturing Germany, there's some of their product behind me. Um, so it's been done in, in conjunction with other partners. Um, it's an excellent resource. If anyone wants um, a link to it, then please um, reach out to me and we can make that available. Um, but essentially, it's showing that the, the importance of the environment of the student. So the environment the student's in is their third teacher. Um, and ff &E, what the child's sitting on, what they're interacting with, is, is really, really important um, in, that, in that environment and that experience. As we said, it's not all about the outcome. It's also about the experience of the child as they go through their, um, their time at school. Um, so then moving on to fitted furniture. Um, so FF&E, for those who are, aren't, aren't aware of what it means, so it means um, furniture, fixtures and equipment. Um, so the fitted furniture are the elements of the building that are fitted to the fabric of the building. So things like the sink units, fitted cupboards, um, cloak rooms, science benches, food tech rooms, that sort of thing. Um, so what to consider when choosing fitted furniture? So there is no industry standard to manage quality control um, within ff &E. the, the output specifications are fairly generic um, to allow there to be a wide range of, of manufacturing supply into the industry. Um, but knowing whether something's fit for purpose can be quite a minefield. Um, so for instance, panel thicknesses vary from manufacturer to manufacturer from 12 mil to 25 mil. Um, hinge quality, ideally your hinge needs to be at least 150 degrees opening, so they open out onto the cupboard next to them, so they don't get accidentally snapped off if they're only 90 degree hinges. Um, having handle-less cupboards um, removes another point of potential damage um, or snagging points, especially where you've got um, pupils in electric wheelchairs, um, they might be turning around and accidentally knock a handle off. I um, mean, it also makes recycling of the units at the end of their useful life easier because you've got one less component to take off before you recycle it. And then robustness um, is really important that you know you're buying a product that's been independently tested because all of us in our industry will tell you that we've got the best product. Um, so it's really important to have an independent um, test and certification. So we went through the journey several years ago with FIRA. Um, so they're an independent... Um, independent testing house, um, and they look essentially at three main things. Um, so general safety, so this is things like no sharp edges, no potential finger pinch points, no exposed fixings or other basic manufacturing issues. There's the stability, so ensure that units are firmly fixed to the wall, and tests involve monitoring the force required to pull units off the wall, and also downward pressure on base units needed to make the units collapse. And then there's structural testing or durability, which is the most critical part of the testing. Um, this essentially gives us expected life cycles and the strength levels to the product. Hopefully, hopefully this plays. Um, so this just shows um, inside FIRA um, some of the storage testing. So essentially, the robots there, they just open and close the doors all day long um, and test the number of times until the product um, starts breaking down. And that gives us a, an expected life cycle of the product. And when we went through this process with FIRA, um, our first attempt with, us, with our product as it was then, it didn't meet the um, level two severe contract use certification, which then drove us into a process of R&D um, to ensure that we were getting a better product. 
Um, so here's an image of our product in the test rig, and you can see there a quick snapshot of the test report data. So one of the most notable developments in our journey um, with, with this independent testing was our, was our hinge design. So we had a, an issue with the pull-out strength where the hinge met the carcass, and we were faced with either having to increase the wall thickness of our carcass, which obviously adds additional cost, or change the carcass material from MFC to MDF, um, which has added implications around environmental impact um, and um, formaldehyde emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So we went away and kind of, how do we sort this problem out? And what we did is we created a very small hinge plate, which is about this big. Um, and this sits behind the hinge. So this is, um, I wanted to do this live today, but I wasn't allowed, so I had to do it in the factory and do a video. Um, so this shows a door being wantonly taken off um, without a hinge plate behind it. And we can see there the damage to the, to the carcass, um, which makes it very difficult to refit a hinge, which means essentially you've got to replace that carcass. So you can see the door's damaged heavily as well, and there's a lot of damage in the carcass. And um, then, so what we did, this small hinge plate that goes behind the hinge, strengthens the relationship between the hinge and the cupboard, and very inexpensive, wraps around the front face of the cupboard as well and it gives you six fixing points into the carcass, and then when we do exactly the same, um, ripping the door off, um, it actually damages the hinge and the hinge into the door as opposed to the hinge into the carcass. So it just it pushes the problem onto a replaceable element um, and keeps that, that part intact. It's much easier to replace a door or a hinge than disconnect a sink or a gas tap or whatever other fitting might be in the worktop above the carcass um, to replace a carcass. So. Um, in the end, it was a very small improvement and a very, very minimal cost improvement, but massive advantage in terms of longevity um, and, and life cycle and maintenance. Um, so now move on to maximising space utilisation across the school estate. Um, so there's a need for children to, to feel comfortable and enjoy going to school, um, and especially when, they're, when we have um, conditions where children might get sensory overload in a mainstream setting. Um, one of the ways is to create group rooms, meeting rooms, and potentially storage areas if we bring storage into the classroom um, through the use of um, like a storage wall or a teacher wall. Um, so then repurpose that, that floor space. Um, and rather than just putting standard tables and chairs into the space, um, maybe put something in there that allows the child to move have extra movement to be more comfortable um, and allows them to be to, to regroup and, and calm themselves down and create a sense of harmony between the student and their surroundings. Um, slowing the pace, um, so we saw a mark slide earlier um, that setting in, in Wales using the corridor as a really smart place to come out and, and um, rebalance. Um, so use of furniture um, in, in especially long corridors, furniture and alcoves just to discourage high-speed traffic and create places of, of pause and reflection. And then maximising adaptability with loose furniture. So th I think this is seen best in the primary setting, um, in the primary school setting where there's essentially a lot of activities happening within the same environment. Um, but if you buy furniture that is a, a family of furniture that can actually be adapted and used for multiple activities, um, you actually end up with less pieces of furniture in the classroom, so the classroom space is actually less cluttered, um, and it actually means that that furniture can, can be reconfigured and used, um, to, and so the classroom can almost feel like a new space every day. Um, typically, that furniture is slightly more expensive than the standard 1,100 by 500 chairs and posturers, um, sorry, tables and posturers, but it does give you that longevity and the ability to have less clutter in the classroom. So you'll see here, this is actually um, some of the, the VS's families. So you'll see in configuration one, set up as a didactic pedagogy, um, as a lecture setting. Um, and then the same furniture can be used and reconfigured into group work. Um, and then again into a U shape um, for more of a conference or group class or debate. Um, so again, thinking about the furniture you're buying um, and investing in the future um, so you can use the spaces for different activities. 
And then moving on to um, the, t the actual product that we're buying. Um, so we've got a case study. There is a case study out on our stand um, from that VS did with, with Ballymena School in Northern Ireland, um, where they actually implemented a trial for 18 months to ensure that their furniture choices were correct. Um, VS have been very successful in um, areas of the country where they're delivering um, PFI or where they're, they're needing a 25-year life cycle. Um, and it's about that long-term investment um, to buy quality product that, that stands and less land and stands for the test of time rather than replacing it every five or ten years. So then there's also um, the need of movement. So a lot of the lower end cost products um, are very rigid and very static um, for that reason, so they don't have any moving parts that break. Um, but when there's no exercise, you can see on the left hand side, um, there's very little stimulation. Um, so for persons who have struggle with concentrating, um, and staying focused, and they get agitated very, very quickly, um, which can then lead to uh, sensory overload and them having to potentially leave the space. Um, if you have a chair um, such as this one here, um, this has actually got a, a three-way mech in it, so when you sit on the chair, um, you can move any way with it. And that just means that that person's got that natural balance, um, so they're constantly, if you've got a fidgeter, um, they're constantly moving. This has also got a built-in feature, so you can't push the chair, so it stops if you're not on it. Um, so they can't be pushed down corridors and um, used for rowing. Um, and then there's other, there's other products as well. Um, come to the stand and, and have a look at them, but they're all around having that, that, natural, um, that natural movement within the body. I and mean, as you can see on the right hand side, when the person who's a fidgeter, if they're active and, they can, and their furniture allows them to move, um, it keep, keeps them stimulated, keeps them engaged, keeps them concentrating for longer. Um, and then, yeah, talking about essentially putting the money up front and, and looking at it as an investment as opposed to just trying to get it for the lowest budget possible. Um, so this particular product, the Club Lounge from VS, um, that particular school in Ballymena, Northern Ireland, were actually replacing um, their soft furniture on average every 12 months. Um, most soft seating products have a timber frame inside them or a steel frame. Um, and if you get two large-ish primary or senior school students jumping on them, um, that frame tends to break, which then renders the chair useless. Um, this is actually a single piece of polyurethane foam, which is then wrapped in fabric. Um, so there is nothing in the chair to break. Um, so they've currently had them for eight years. Um, and on the next slide you'll see, although the price points um, almost triple, um, or just over triple the price of an aspect chair, which is a very budget um, entry level soft seating chair, um, you'll see that by year three, um, they'd, they were even Stevens. And then as you went on, you know, by the time they get to 10 years old, they're almost three times cheaper. Um, so really just, just to prove the point that um, when we're looking at places where we're trying to, in, trying to integrate um, SEND into mainstream schools, think about where we could potentially invest a little bit more money um, to make the furniture last longer and essentially ultimately save money over its life cycle. So three key takeaways. Um, ensure your fitted furniture is independently tested. Explore creative use of small spaces to reduce challenging episodes um, and consider the benefits of lifestyle costing for your loose FF&E. Thank you very much.